welcome to Midco Sports Magazine. Our theme this month is for the love of the game, and we've got three great stories along those lines. We'll go to Seward, Nebraska, a small town that grows to five times its size every 4th of July because of a unique event that brings together the best pole vaulting competition in the country. It's kind of a state fair and a state track meet all rolled into one. Then we'll go halfway around the world to Toyama, Japan, where a young man from Pierce, South Dakota has taken his love of the game from the Midwest to the Far East. Well, we start right here at Sioux Falls Lincoln High School and a young woman who's 15 years old that could run around this track 50 times and not even stop or slow down if she wanted to. Our reporter on this story, Jason Andera, covers a lot of great high school athletes in basketball and baseball and volleyball and track, but Katie Patrick is a little different kind of competitor. Here's Jason with the story. It's your typical high school cross country meet. Runners get loose to prepare to run their best race. Katie Patrick is no different. She doesn't necessarily stand out until you see her compete. If there was a way to calculate determination, Katie would be off the charts. She turns endless hours of monotonous training into triumph after triumph in the field of competition. I love it and sometimes I hate it, to be honest. Um, sometimes the, the training days get very long, but I'd say the reason that I keep doing it is because like every morning when I wake up, I just, like, I'm just determined to do something so that I'll feel good when I go to bed. That elite determination didn't get by her cross country coach, Eric Pooley. Katie's been on the Lincoln High School cross country team since she was a seventh grader. I think she just wanted to improve. She wasn't necessarily elite middle school talent wise. She just wanted, had a desire to, to run at the next level and get better. She came in as a seventh grader, kind of underdeveloped and had a lot to learn. And she totally just, you could tell she had the desire and the dedication to, to go forth and really go to the next level. Although Katie excels at cross country, it's fitting that this teenager that can't sit still found not one, but three sports to suit her skills. Katie fell in love with the sport of triathlon at an early age. Well, my dad did Ironman when I was growing up, and so we'd go to our lake cabin and my dad would swim across the lake and I'd kayak next to him, or on the way to the lake, we'd drop him off halfway out and he'd bike in. Watching him finish these Ironman, I always wanted to do an Ironman but being six years old when I started, my dad wasn't gonna enter me in an Ironman, so. We started with a kids triathlon in Chisago, and my brother and I did it, and um, I ended up winning it, even though it was a very small triathlon. It wasn't what I thought. I thought I was a stud at the time, but definitely not. That early success continued for this spunky sophomore who is now ranked number five in the nation among junior elite women. Katie trains year round for the three sport sport that she loves. Most teenagers require prodding to build good habits. No, Katie is just the opposite. She is really one you gotta hone, hone back and she has every desire. She wants to get up really early in the morning uh, to go swim and she wants to come to school, full day of school, then she wants to go after school, do cross country practice and then sometimes she even wants to go and do a night workout. So she is just the opposite where you gotta tell her, hey Katie, you know, we want you to do this, and then we'll limit those other things and try to, you know, balance and let you be a kid still. School, training, eating and sleeping consume her stuffed schedule. But that's where Katie sets herself apart. Full day often means waking up at 4 a.m. to get a morning bike ride in before school, followed by a focused day in the classroom, then off to run with her cross country team, followed by a practice with her swim team. I've kind of learned to just focus on one thing at a time. So when I'm at school, don't worry about training. When I'm in world history class, think about world history and like vice versa. When I'm in training, don't think about school. I'm swimming, I need to work on my technique and my focus. So I just do, I do one thing at a time. I don't try to jumble it all and, and try to like do math while I'm on the bike or something. Although I've been known to do that maybe a couple times. Katie's personality, charm, and composure give her a perspective beyond her years. She's willing to give up some things that other high school kids would not. 
I've kind of chosen sport over a, like a real heavy social life, which I'm totally okay with. So I'll train in Des Moines and um, we stay at a house with a bunch of triathletes. We usually run to the pool, we swim, we do some strength, and then we do, we usually just eat and sleep until our night workouts. And then we work out and then we strength, yoga, and then we go to bed and then we repeat it the next day. It's the whole summer, it takes up all day because if you're not eating 100%, if you're not sleeping 100%, you're not gonna train 100%. And that's something that we're very, like it's very serious about because I'll, I know that I'm not gonna have a good workout if I'm like at the pool all day and then I go to a workout. In a time when teenagers are always plugged in, Katie's at her best when she's unplugged and competing. The real thing that keeps me going is uh, is those races, going to the races, seeing those people that do what I do and from all over the world and racing them and seeing who's the best on race day and trying to be the best and just working for to cross the finish line first. That's something that really motivates me. Her sports, or sports rather, have taken her to some pretty cool places. South Dakota, obviously. Um, Ohio, um, Virginia, Seattle, Iowa, Florida, Mexico, Texas. Racing makes you better. So we do, we try to race a lot. It's, um, so we probably do, I probably do a race every two weeks. Being a top five ranked triathlete comes with some perks. She has sponsors that help her compete in races across the country with her team, Z3, based in Des Moines, Iowa. Her goals are as lofty as her ambition. This year, I think the goal for the end of the year was probably Worlds or Youth Olympic Games, and I was really close, but I didn't quite make it. And so next year, I think the goal would definitely be um, that world spot, since the Youth Olympic Games only comes every four years. Um, so I definitely want to be uh, probably top, top five at Worlds. And in my high school years, I'd like to keep going to the Junior Worlds. And then as I compete, I want to go to college for triathlon. And, and out of college, I'd be looking at the 2020 or the 2016 Olympics, for sure. That's something that, um, it's a goal of mine. It's something I'm going to try to pursue as long as I can and try to make it there. There's Jason and Dara. And Jason, this summer you competed in a sprint triathlon and finished it, correct? Competing is a loose term. Uh, but, but did it give you some appreciation for what Katie Patrick does? Very much so. It made me realize how good of an athlete she really is and how good of an athlete you have to be in different aspects of the different sports. It was kind of funny when I talked to her, she actually was giving me a few pointers. That's just the kind of girl that Katie is. And she's not the only one in her family that competes this way, right? No, she caught the bug, as she said in the story, from her dad who does Ironman triathlons, but in fact their whole family does triathlon. They do a, a family triathlon at their cabin every summer, and uh, she's been getting better and better, and now is probably the best in her family. All right, nice job, man. Jason Andera. Coming up next on Midco Sports Magazine, an event that started small in the streets of Seward, Nebraska, but has grown into an enormous annual event. Get set for pole vaulting in the streets. Seriously, it's coming up next. Welcome back to Midco Sports Magazine. Our next story is a little odd, a little quirky. It's uh, definitely a group of people who love their game and they love to get together and compete. And it's based on a legitimate track and field event. And it started small, but it has blown up into a huge event on the 4th of July every year in Seward, Nebraska. Here's Alex Heiner with the story. Welcome to Seward, Nebraska. This typical Midwest town 26 miles to the northwest of Lincoln is home to roughly 7,000 residents on any given day. But every July 4th, Seward becomes anything but ordinary. Each year, an estimated 40,000 people gather within the city limits to celebrate Independence Day. The city has hosted festivities on the nation's birthday since 1868 and has become something of a magnet for red, white, and blue revelers. So much so that in 1979, Congress named Seward America's official 4th of July city. But while Seward's 4th of July celebration features a parade, an apple pie eating contest, a giant fireworks salute, and many other Independence Day standards, it's what takes place on Main Street that separates this city celebration from others you might see across the country. 
For the last 24 years, on July 4th, Seward becomes the nation's unofficial capital of pole vault. The 4th of July street vault competition began in 1990, the brainchild of Jason Berry and Gene Brooks, both of whom were vaulting for Seward's Concordia University at the time. It's grown from a novelty event for local collegiate athletes to a full exhibition that featured over 90 competitors across 10 divisions this summer. Barry, who now coaches pole vault at both Concordia and Seward High School, explains how the events came to be. A group of us back in college were just highly competitive people, and we loved to find excuses to compete. And they used to have the fireworks show at college, and we thought, oh man, there's all these people out here, why don't we vault? So we called all of our buddies, all the other college vaulters, and said, we're going to have a competition before the fireworks show, and uh, they just showed up. And so we started vaulting, competing, having a good time, and it's kind of developed. Brooks, a five-time national champion vaulter at the NAIA level for the Bulldogs, says that even though the event started small, it didn't take long for it to grow. The first year was probably, it, was, it wasn't bad, it was probably 20 people. Uh, it caught on really quickly. We were pulling people from a lot of different states, different levels, Division I, II, III, NAIA. The popularity of the Seward Street Vault didn't spread because of a cutting-edge marketing strategy or a barrage of social media advertising. Word of mouth is amazing. And you hear some of the great vaulters that stay track me go, oh, I'm going to vault on the fourth. And then it just spreads. It's just word on the street. You know, in, in the pole vaulting community, there aren't that many street vaults that happen. And um, word spreads quickly. Next thing you know, we're like, Oh man, we're so excited. We got like 20 people coming. You know, a couple years ago, we had over 60 people. I'm like, man, that's huge. We had one runway, and I'm like, okay, I'm, we're gonna put a second runway. Two years later, we've got 94. 94 vaulters. Now I have people talking, you need a third runway. The event has grown to draw vaulters from coast to coast, with athletes ranging in age from five to 45 from across 14 different states. Over the years, the field has included high school state champions, NCAA and NAIA national champions, and U.S. Olympians. Two of the most decorated athletes at this year's competition were Bridget Gross, a three-time national champion from the University of Sioux Falls, and Christian Sanderfer, a University of Nebraska vaulter who earned runner-up honors at the Big Ten Indoor and Outdoor Championships last season. Both have been regulars at the 4th of July vault in recent years, and both are big fans of the event. Heck yeah, 4th of July, pole vault? I'm ready. The first year rained, so we vaulted inside, but came back for two more years, and um, it was beautiful like this, and I've had a blast. I enjoy it every year. I make it something uh, of a precedent. Uh, I like to show the crowd what pole vault has to offer and show the younger kids what you can accomplish. You can really have fun with the event and just show the crowd what you're all about. You don't have to be super serious all the time, which is a nice change of pace. That laid back atmosphere combined with the patriotic nature of the day lends to the variety of interesting uniform choices and maybe surprisingly helps the competitors reach new heights. There's nothing to qualify for. There's nothing you got to prove. There's, you know, there's, I mean, it's just come out here and be relaxed and have fun. And sometimes you actually end up performing a lot better than when you have all that pressure on you. If we can continue to, to build the events, build the knowledge of the pole vault, and build the community of it, the sports is going to thrive. And thanks to the dedication of Jason Berry, Gene Brooks, and many others, on Independence Day in Seward, Nebraska, pole vault will continue to thrive for years to come. Joined by Alex Heinert, and Alex, you, you follow track and field around the country pretty well. You know what's going on. Have you ever seen anything like this anywhere else in the nation? Not like this. I mean, there are other places that do a street vault competition. There's a massive one in Las Vegas where a lot of people gather, but with this type of a feel where it is, this small town that just explodes and everybody gets so into this, it's, it's unique in the country, absolutely. And they will do it again? Next Every year, year. Yep, absolutely. They love that thing down there in Seward, Nebraska. Great story, man. Thanks, man. Alex Heinert. Up next on Midco Mag, 
we will take you to Japan by way of Pierre, South Dakota, and the story of Sam Willard, who is the biggest grouse in the house, playing for his team in Toyama. Welcome back to Midco Mag. Well, Sam Willard graduated from high school in Pierre, South Dakota. And as a six foot 10 Caucasian kid from the States, I'm guessing that he stands out in a crowd where he lives now in Toyama, Japan. As David Brown reports, this kid from the Midwest has found a home for hoops in the Far East. There's no I in team, and there's no I in basketball, but there is one in isolation. At nearly seven feet tall, Sam Willard rarely gets called for isolation plays on the court. But the feeling is something familiar. There's gonna be times of loneliness for every single person. This is one of the rare occasions where Sam gets to be at home in Pierre. The glory days at TF Riggs High School are long gone, but the gym and the memories are still here. I was watching game tape the other day randomly enough I was a lot smaller than I thought. <laughs> Since graduating in 2007, Sam's basketball journey has taken him to the coasts and beyond. He played well enough in his home gym to earn a scholarship to the University of Pacific in California. It was very different right away. Workouts started right away, summer school started right away. Um, you know, being away from home for the first time, really. Um, it was a little bit of a culture shock, but I loved it. I loved every bit of it. By his senior season, Sam averaged more than 14 points and 10 rebounds a game. Good enough to get some recognition from an unfamiliar place, the country of Latvia. I was very interested in trying it out. Um, I wasn't scared to go overseas. You know, I was, I was very excited, to be honest, to be able to just devote every single thing in my life to doing that and just being able to focus on one thing. I, I was excited about that. Sam signed with the team known as BK Ventspils in the summer of 2011. And while he was happy to be playing basketball, he soon realized that going from South Dakota to California was a much easier transition. Going away from home, going to UOP is one thing. Going away from home to Latvia is a whole, a whole different thing. Uh, you're by yourself for nine months pretty much, you know, living by yourself without constant communication because of the time difference. So it was very different. The language issue was, was the biggest one. Um, it's a lot harder to talk to your teammates. My coach spoke English, which was helpful, um, but it's, it's very different. He was playing a kid's game, but living in a very grown up world. You know, you're a professional and this is your job and they're paying you to do this. So you're not a kid anymore. You can't be sitting in your room complaining that you're lonely because you miss home, you know? At some point you gotta focus on at what's at hand and do what you've been paid to do. His season in Latvia had its ups and downs. While he visited more than a dozen countries, he also missed eight weeks with an ankle injury. But more than 18 hours away, home provided comfort. My family is amazing. Um, you know, any single time there's ever been a game broadcast at three, four in the morning, you know, midnight, whatever, they watch. My mom FaceTimes, my mom Skypes, you know, my dad too, my, my sister, all my friends. So I'm very lucky to have a supporting staff like them. And he would need them after the season when BK Ventspils decided not to bring him back. And to be honest, those summer months are very difficult. Um, you just play the waiting game and you have no idea. The Sendai 89ers from Japan made him an offer and Sam played for them in the 2012-2013 season. But once again, after just one year, he wasn't brought back. You realize very quickly over there that it is a business, that there are hundreds of other guys in your exact same position that would kill to be where you are. Um, so you'd never forget that, that's very important. Sam eventually signed with another team in Japan, the Toyama Grouses. Averaging a double-double at 12 points and 12 rebounds a game, Sam led his team to its best season ever, culminating in a third place finish in the Basketball Japan League semifinals. His experience over the past two years has actually led to a bit of celebrity status for the man who admits he sticks out like a sore thumb. Samu, 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 like that's how they say my name and stuff, but 
they'll ask you to autograph stuff randomly in the street. You know, I've signed shoes and backpacks and shirts while people are wearing them. And I try to explain that they do not want that autograph. It's not worth enough. Um, they're so they're so loving and so so great. Three teams in three years. It may not be exactly how Sam thought his post-college career would go, but he's well aware of how lucky he's been. The overall experience has been great, and I think it is important to take time and sit back and reflect on you know this past season or this past, be it even just this past game, just so you can continue to grow. And while his experience overseas has continued, he knows his playing career isn't guaranteed for much longer. Each day and each season brings the possibility of more isolation, away from home and away from the game. But Sam's outlook will continue to have him involved in the sport that's become his life. After I'm done playing, I'm, I'm probably going to end up going into coaching at some point. You know, I just, I'm getting in, I'm getting more into the mental part of the game now. It's, it's just been great going through all these different players and all these different coaches and just being able to evolve my own game and my own understanding of the game, it's, it's exciting and, and I love it still. And Sam always knows he can go home because even though on this day he's shooting around all by himself, the support he has away from the gym will leave him anything but isolated. Here's David Brown and David, when you talked to Sam this summer, right, he was not even sure that he was gonna go back and re-sign with this team in Toyama, right? Yeah, but he eventually did resign. He will be back with a second season for the Toyama Grouses. The first time in his international career, he's actually stayed with the same team for two consecutive years. But as you saw on the piece, he eventually wants to get into coaching. So right now he's just absorbing as much knowledge of the game, the international game, as much as he can, and he hopes that it will lead to a prosperous coaching career. All right, nice job. Thanks, David Brown. And thank you for watching Midco Sports Magazine.